December 4th, 1783. Washington's farewell to his officers. You are there. Porter Cronkite reporting, December 4th, 1783. Today in New York, General George Washington, Commander-in-Chief of the victorious Continental Army, is leaving to go home. The war is over, the long-delayed peace treaty has been signed, and the British troops have evacuated the city. The New York Patriots are still wildly jubilant for two weeks. They have hailed General Washington as no leader has ever been hailed before. He's been acclaimed the national hero, the man who through eight years of incredible hardship and difficulties led the revolution to victory. Today, this man, too, is to say farewell. He, too, is going home. Just before General Washington departs on his journey back to Mount Vernon in Virginia, he's arranged a last meeting with a group of his officers in Francis Tavern, a well-known dining establishment near Whitehall. From there, the general will board a barge that will carry him to Powell's Hook and a waiting horse. Among those called to this final assemblage are men who have been with Washington in every campaign. What will he say to them now that all the battles are ended and the moment of parting has come? We take you to Francis Tavern in New York. All things are as they were then, except... You are there. This is Harry Marble in Francis Tavern here in New York. This farewell meeting was called for noon. It is now some 20 minutes short of that hour, and we expect that the officers will start arriving at any moment. Outside, there's quite a crowd gathered for a last glimpse of General Washington. We understand also that the streets leading from here to the wharf at Whitehall, the departing point, are also thronged with waiting spectators. That fife, drum, and bugle for you here seems to have been playing continuously for two weeks, ever since the general and his army entered the city. That is Sam Francis, the owner of the tavern. He is the general's favorite northern host and cook, having served him on many occasions before the tide of battle swept the Continental Army out of New York. Here are two officers, the first to arrive. Welcome, gentlemen. Your names, gentlemen? Colonel Small, 4th Massachusetts. Major Thayer, the same. How long have you served, sir? Five years. And you, sir? From the beginning. Has either of you ever had personal contact with General Washington? I don't know what you mean by personal contact. He once threatened to strip me of my rank. Why was that, sir? My men were complaining. They didn't have enough food for their bellies. I couldn't explain to them why they should always be hungry. What happened? The general called me in. I went back and I explained it to them. Did you ever personally meet the general, sir? I met him many times. In battles? In battles, in between battles. Long Island, Trenton, West Point. Can you give us your impression of him? You mean his physical appearance? No, just your impression of him as a man, his character. Well, I don't know. He always struck me as a Virginia gentleman. They kind of speak to you cool like and far away. Then you have no other fond, no warm impression of him at all? None, except that uh, he gave the leadership that won the war. Thank you, sir. Morning, gentlemen. Small. How do you do, sir? There, General. It's good seeing you, man, again. You, sir, would you identify yourself? Brigadier General James Clinton. You are General Clinton. You stopped the British at Kingston. My men stopped them. Weren't you also at Yorktown, sir, when Cornwallis surrendered? You evoked the most pleasant of my memories. I was also present at some of our own disasters. Quebec? Quebec and others. You must know General Washington quite well. As far back as the French and Indian War. Is it true that he is by nature an aloof man? He's a reserved man. He doesn't spout and snort. Likes to weigh things carefully before taking action. But does he ever show any emotion at all? You mean by that anger? Or scorn or hatred? Or pity or affection or joy. His true feelings. Very rarely. What do you think he will say to you at this most sensitive occasion? How will he behave? He will be polite, mannered, gracious. And if he says anything at all, it'll be very proper. Probably extremely dull. And what, if I may ask, sir, are your feelings toward him? He is a great leader. I've served under him here on Earth. I'd serve under him anywhere, heaven or hell. Thank you, General Clinton. 
General. Thank you. Montero. General. Small, it's good to see you. Tell me. Well, the old boy isn't here yet, huh? No, sir, he's not. Mr. Francis certainly has outdone himself. Would you identify yourself, sir? Oh. Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin Tolmich. Can you tell us something about yourself and your activities with the Army? All that? Well, anything you choose, sir. Well, I hardly know what to say about myself. I was born in Brookhaven. I graduated from Yale in 73. And soon after, I joined the Connecticut Regiment. And now, like General Washington, I'd like to go home. Where have you seen action, sir? Oh, in Brandywine. Germantown, Monmouth. I led the attack on Fort St. George, where we destroyed quite a store of their supplies. Weren't you also connected in some way with the capture of the British spy, Major Andre? He was in my custody until his execution. You know General Washington personally? I do. How do you feel about this last meeting with him? Well, I haven't thought about it. We were asked to assemble here. I suppose the General will have a little speech to make to us. He usually does. Certainly is a sad occasion. You don't appear to be very sad. I've had enough of sadness. Eight years of it. The general should be overjoyed. We have accomplished this miraculous thing. This revolution. The celebrations are just beginning. They're just beginning. What's there to be sad about? While we are waiting for more of the officers to arrive, we will take you to General Washington's quarters. Come in, Ned Calmer. This is Ned Calmer in General Washington's rooms in Cape's Tavern on Broadway and Thames Street. The general is all packed and ready to leave for the farewell meeting and then the journey home. That's Lieutenant Colonel David Humphreys, one of the general's aides who will accompany him on the trip. We should be leaving in a few minutes, sir. It's almost noon. Colonel, do you think I will be able to buy children's books in Philadelphia? They had none here. If you would give me the list of the things you still wish to purchase, sir, I would be happy to see the merchants for you. My list never seems to end. I have here a locket, a whirligig, fiddle, quadrille boxes. I thought I had bought all the Christmas presents for Mrs. Washington and the grandchildren, but this morning I was thinking of the servants and the neighbors. Well, do what you can with it. Oh, uh, by the way, who is to pay Mr. Francis for this last collection of his foods and wines? I assume it will be part of Governor Clinton's burden. Will Governor Clinton be at Francis Tavern? Yes, sir. The civil dignitaries will await you as you leave there. I wonder if the people know that Clinton had to borrow money from the quartermaster in Philadelphia to pay for our victorious entry here and for all the entertainments and celebrations thereof. I imagine he'll be glad uh, when we're going, sir. I wish General Green would have been there. I would not mind to have had Lafayette. You know, Colonel, I have no notion at all as to what I should say on this occasion. Whatever you choose to say, sir, I'm certain it will be found most appropriate. You're too kind. If I may say so, sir, I hope you hope you do not attempt a major pronouncement. I'm through with major pronouncements, Colonel. Through, I trust, for the rest of my days. I think on this occasion I should be brief, friendly, and cheerful. Would you agree? These partings are most difficult, sir. This one, above all. I hold no other group of men in higher esteem. Their admiration for you, sir, is not less. Call me when we're ready. Yes, sir.
General Washington, would it be too much of an intrusion to know your thoughts at this moment? My thoughts? What are they indeed? At long last of going home. Of retirement from an arduous task. Of peace and green hills in a warm house to be with family and friends. And what of the past, sir, the war? The war was many things. Mistakes, misfortunes, hardships, many things. But above all, the spirit of devotion of the men, soldiers and officers. Spirit more noble than I can readily describe. Battles fought with empty cartridge boxes and empty stomachs of wagons without horses and horses without forage. If a shoeless survivor fell ill, he was sent to the hospital where half alive he would still whisper no to any mutineer who would suggest going over to the frenzied British. And yet they fought, though there was neglect, incompetence, treachery and defeat, months without pay, and pay without purchasing power. It was this spirit that enabled me to give what leadership I could, with what patience and faith and resolution I could summon, It is to such men that I am about to say farewell. It is a task far more painful than I feel able to perform. We must leave now, sir. We return you to Francis Tavern and Harry Marble. We are back at Francis Tavern, and all the invited officers of the immediate vicinity have now arrived and are waiting for the general. There you see General von Steuben, who trained much of the army in military technique and discipline. General von Steuben, what are your feelings, sir, on this farewell meeting? I am happy for General Washington that he goes now home. But I hope he does not stay there too long. What prompts you to say that, sir? This war is over. Another one soon begins. The British sail away, but you are not finished with them or with other enemies of your freedom. You are not finished here. Washington takes a rest, but then he must come back. There is much Schweinerei here before you have a unity and a nation. From your long military experience, General, how do you estimate the leadership given by General Washington? <laughs> In the Prussian army, I get shot if I answer such a question. That's why I come here. <laughs> I argue with General Washington over his tactics for the whole war. We argue, argue, argue. And who is proven right? Sometimes we are both right, sometimes we are both wrong. But he's more often right than I am. I am proud to fight a war with him. And what will you do now that the war is over? Ah, I make trouble for your Congress. I lose my fortune here and everything. I make trouble for some pension or something. You must understand that when a baron fights for a revolution, it, it is not the same as a farmer or a blacksmith. I'm still a baron. What do you expect General Washington will say here to all of you? It does not matter what he will say. It is eight years. We are together. And now it comes to the end. Whatever he will say, it will only make me like a fool to cry. Thank you, sir. General McDougall. This is Major General Alexander McDougall, who succeeded Benedict Arnold in the command of West Point after the latter's treachery. General McDougall, weren't you one of the chief officers recently involved in threatening Congress with rebellion if they did not meet the demands for pay? 
That is correct. What was the exact threat made, sir? As I remember it, we issued a call for a meeting. We said, tell Congress that though we were the first and would wish to be the last to encounter danger, though despair itself could never drive you into dishonor, it may drive you from the field. Was that all, sir? No, sir, there was more. We also said that the wound, often irritated and never healed, may at length prove incurable. And that the slightest mark of disunity now from Congress must operate like the grave and part you forever. You are putting it rather strongly, don't you think, General? We went further than that. We said that in any political event, the Army has its alternative. If peace, then nothing but death can separate them from your arms. If war, that courting the auspices and inviting the direction of your illustrious leader, you will retire to some unsettled country, smile in your turn, and mock when the fear cometh on. As I interpret that threat, it meant that the officers were being called on to desert Congress, to leave the coast defenseless, and set up a new state in the wilderness. That is correct. And if peace came, they would not lay down their arms. And how did General Washington react to this? He called a general meeting and denounced any course that would leave the country defenseless. He showed us the futility of our threat and the terrible danger to the cause for which we had fought. And what about the demands for pay? Oh, those he hardly agreed upon and forced Congress to act upon them. Then you won the demands for pay? Some of them we did, yes. But we still have not been paid. The rank and file is being discharged with a musket and a promise. How is it, sir, if I may ask, that you were not court-martialed? I said that General Washington supported our demands. He understood our anger. And I would also say that he provided us with a more tolerant vision. His own vision, I would say. How do you feel? What are your thoughts at this parting here? I have fought in many battles against tyranny from the days of the Sons of Liberty. The British threw me in jail on the charge of spreading seditious literature. We've had this bloody war now and we have thrown them out. Washington gave himself as no other man I know to the cause that has engaged my life. All the glory he has now cannot repay the inhuman burden that he was asked to bear. How shall I feel about parting with such a man? How indeed. General Knox, if you please, sir. General Knox forced the British to evacuate Boston and was in charge of artillery for the army. Is that correct, sir? It is, but you say it like my, my epitaph. I'm not retiring yet, presently commanding at West Point. Perhaps you can tell us this, sir. Of all the generals at the start of the war, how many are present here now? Well, let me see. Congress Commission 29. Present here are three, Von Steuben, McDougall, and myself. What happened to the others? Seven resigned, six died, one Benedict Arnold betrayed us. The rest, Green is still south, all the others elsewhere. Our casualties and generals was quite high. Of all the officers assembled here, who would you say, sir, knows General Washington most intimately? I would say I do. You have seen him, as it were, in other than formal situations? Many times. How does he behave under less formal conditions? Generally, more formal. Then would you say he was intrinsically cold and impersonal? I would say it is a matter of a great will and self-training for many years to react to all situations with the objectivity of the mind rather than the uncertain recklessness of the heart. Is he personally an unhappy man? A worrying man. A suffering man. A very proud. At times a very lonely man. No, not an unhappy man. Underneath the calm exterior there is a passionate devotion to the largest and smallest responsibilities in life. Such a man cannot be called unhappy. His sense of accomplishment must always be enormous. This meeting here, will he respond to the emotion it holds? Very deeply, but you may never see it. What does this farewell mean to you, General Knox? Well, there's too much memory for all of us to face here. The General, I'm certain, will set a light and casual tone. And I will help pass it off very properly as just another bloody bore. General Washington. General? 
How are you, Sam? Fine, sir, fine. May I ask, sir, how is Mrs. Washington? She could be better, Sam. Maybe she will, sir, when you come home. I'm sure of it. What choice British morsels have you prepared for us? There's no food like this in the world. General, I trust you haven't changed your mind about accompanying me to Philadelphia? Nine, nine, I must see the celebration there. Gentlemen, will you join me? Well, sirs, with a heart full of love and gratitude, I now take my leave of you. I most devoutly wish that your later days will be as happy and prosperous as have your former ones been honorable and glorious. I would feel much obliged if each of you would come to me that I might shake your hand. What's your name, son? Colonel Small, 4th Massachusetts, sir. The officer had received his embrace. The general walked across the room, raised his arm in a silent final farewell, and passed through the door, out of the tavern, on his way to the wharf. At the wharf, every foot of space was crowded, and many held up little children to look at this great man who was trying to set his mouth and keep taut the muscles of his face against further tears. George Washington left for the journey home. The war was over, and he never thought that the day would come when he would have to make the journey back. When the day did come, six years later, he returned as the first president of the United States. The people had called again, and being the absolute patriot, service to his country being his supreme ideal, Washington once more accepted the mantle of highest leadership. He did not know on that day of the farewell to his officers that the source of that love and compassion he showed for his comrades in arms could never be retired and would never let him rest. What sort of a day was it? A day like all days, filled with those events that alter and illuminate our time. And you were there.